Good morning. Welcome, um, welcome to Tianjin. Welcome to the 12th annual meeting of the uh, new champions. Uh, if you were not here yesterday, and welcome back for all of you who were. Um, thank you for getting up early, uh, tackling the traffic, tackling security, uh, and all being here in a timely manner. We appreciate that. Um, we have a, a fantastic panel uh, lined up for, for you all here. Um, as you can see, a couple of our panelists are still uh, grappling with the reality of Tianjin traffic, um, but will be here uh, very shortly. Um, my name is Derek O'Halloran. Um, I work with the World Economic Forum. I'm responsible for shaping the overall digital agenda uh, with the forum. Um, and this topic, which um, is very close to our hearts, and I think by the presence in the room at this early hour, indicates very close to many of your hearts, is one of uh, critical and fundamental importance. Um, the uh, idea that we have divides in society, structural divides in society, is one that has been with us for some time. And technology holds a huge amount of promise to address those divides and to bring greater economic, social, uh, and political inclusion to people, to voices who, who haven't been heard uh, in, in the past. At the same time, uh, technology, the advancement of technology, and uh, who gets to use it, and who gets to benefit from it, and who gets to profit from it, is something which moves very fast. And we see an awful lot of the initial benefits accruing to a small portion of, of society. Whether you think of that in terms of the fact that we have yet to connect 50% of people to the internet, uh, all the way through to the concentration uh, of the, the, the profits and capital returns um, from the technology investments, we can see it in multiple ways. Furthermore, because the benefits from technology are uh, exponential and because they're self-reinforcing, um, we, uh, we face the prospect that we may be um, entering into a situation where if we don't address some of the divides that exist today, then those gaps just get wider and wider and become more difficult to address and more difficult to manage, uh, potentially leading to uh, condemning large portions of, of the population to intergenerational uh, exclusion. So that's certainly not something we want. Um, on the other side, we have all of the tools at our disposal, the technologies that we have, the fourth industrial revolution technologies are about democratization and uh, the, the, the flattening of structures and the enabling and the empowerment of, uh, uh, of, of inclusion uh, across the board. So uh, I think with that teeing, teeing up, I, I will um, hand over to our esteemed panelists to lead us through this discussion in terms of how we're going, how we should be thinking about it. This is not something we'll solve overnight. But what are some of the that we hear Thank you so much. Um, I think the fact that Derek showed up this morning is a very good reflection of how seriously the World Economic Forum takes the issue of digital inclusion and sh the wide sharing of the economic benefits of digital technology. And I think it's an incredibly important theme. And the fact that you're all here so early in the morning, we really appreciate. Um, so this panel is entitled Fourth Industrial Revolution Haves and Have Nots. So our job is to discuss how the digital revolution and datafication of society uh, has impacted, will continue to impact economic inclusion, equality, and the relative positions and economic standing of country, uh, countries in relation to each other, businesses and sectors of, the, of industry, as well as workers. On the one hand, fourth industrial revolution technologies are expected to create $3.7 trillion in value uh, for companies and countries across global su supply chains by 2025. But the, as we've said, the equal distribution of those benefits is not at all guaranteed. New research from the McKinsey Global Institute says that while AI has huge potential to contribute to global economic growth, widening gaps between countries, companies and workers need to be managed and mitigated. So key point is that economic inequality has been a challenge that we have faced and it has been an enduring governance 
challenge for time immemorial, certainly well before digital technology hit. Um, our concern is how will digital technology exacerbate those trends? What's different about the digital revolution? Um, concerns are rising globally that fourth IR technologies will exacerbate inequality, cause massive labor displacement, create monopoly power, and build wealth for a smaller and smaller group of people. So the overarching questions we want to address in this session is how can we help ensure that the fourth industrial revolution and the technologies created in this process help mitigate the inequalities between countries and between communities within the same societies. Um, we, as always, the job for governing actors is to figure out how to capitalize on the upside and protect against the downside risks. How to think about inequality within their own societies as well as taking responsibility for the global dyna dynamics in terms of inequality. Um, so our panelists will answer some basic questions. Um, whether we have a basis for optimism that these technologies will help us reach UN Sustainable Development Goals. We'll ask what practical steps can be taken to ensure wider distribution of the benefits, both within and between societies and different kinds of What kind of governance models and social innovations, policies and processes that the benefits are widely spread. And that's going to take a lot of creativity. We have an outstanding subgroup of our panelists, and hopefully, um, the two people yet I will actually reference. Uh, Rafat Al Akhali is chairman of Resonate uh, Yemen Foundation, and he's a young global leader. And it could be that Rafat did not just walk in, but he's. We have a new guest. <laughs> um, we also have uh, Seth Berkeley is chief executive officer of Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance of Geneva, and he's going to talk about the consequences for health technologies and how that affects inequality. Uh, we have the Minister of Science and Technology from South Africa, Mama Loko Kubai Ngubani. And we have the head of the European Political Strategy Center, uh, the European Commission from Brussels, Anne Mettler. And we have the chief executive officer of soft robotics uh, from the United States, Carl Voss. Um, so I think we'll start with um, Minister Nukbani. Um, tell us about the context in South Africa and whether you have seen the benefits of particularly fourth industrial revolution technologies um, positively or negatively affecting inequality within South Africa itself. Um, thank you very much and good morning to the, I hope I'm, I'm audible enough. Um, look, in terms of inequality, we know that the machines are going to create some level of inequality because they will likely, if we don't implement them correctly, we're likely to see continuing inequality. And I say this because we have to make sure that we correctly um, address the issues of skilling and reskilling. We take advantage of being a country that has young people, population almost 60% of our population is young people, and we see it as an opportunity um, for skilling correctly to make sure that we can see the benefits. Otherwise, we one of the countries that is regarded as the most unequal, unequal society. So to address that, we have to deal with the issues of the young people that are there. Obviously, looking at um, artificial intelligence, for example, the, the impact of fourth industrial revolution, from governance point of view, from government and, and institution, specifically being responsible for research and development in the country, We've looked at various areas. We already, um, we've got our council, one of our council, research council, that is looking in terms of the impact thereof, in terms of researching for new technologies around radiation briefly, and we're utilizing that, creating entrepreneurs, for example, commercializing what we find as technologies that we have researched about. 
So in that way, we're not only creating a future of seekers, but entrepreneurs. And once you do that, then you are able to deal with some of the issues that you can be able to find around um, the threat that is being ra raised around um, the fourth industrial revolution. But equally as well, um, from our institutions, both um, University of Johannesburg, University of Pretoria are also looking into this. So it's not an easy thing to say you can quickly solve the issues of inequality, isn't it? But you've got to be able to position yourself correctly, do the right thing to be able to donate it. Um, especially for us, as other countries might see it as better, but for developing countries specifically, because you have a number of people who are living in abject poverty, living in the extreme level of um, in terms of um, cost of living and you know, in terms of their livelihoods within their families. So you've got to be able to say, out of those families, out of that population, what is it that we can do to be able to assist them to leapfrog and find opportunities in the fourth industrial revolution? And that is, as for me, important thing. It's skilling. The important thing is being able to provide for the population and change the mindset from only not only being job seekers but being entrepreneurs. Great. And it does sound like perhaps you have focused on youth and the younger generation in terms of training as it relates to this technology. What, what are you doing at the other end of the spectrum for people in the you know, middle of their careers or later in terms of being displaced by technology? Look, you're looking at reskilling. Let me just make an example. One of the things that we've done recently, last week, we're launching our research and development in the mining sector. Um, our country is rich with minerals, so we have quite a huge sector of, of mining. And part of the issue is to look at what is it that you can do to not displace workers. And you find with our shafts, for example, I'm not so sure if colleagues are familiar with the mining industry. You find there are areas in terms of what we call shafts that gets closed because human beings are not able to dig deeper to be able to find minerals. So in that way, one of the things that we're looking at, are you able to use, for example, robotics in that area? So you're not displacing, but you're making sure the mining company becomes sustainable itself. In that way, you still sustain the jobs. Because if the mining company, out of what they, they are able to extract out of the minerals, less than what is for them value, then they would close down. But if you are able to balance between the shafts that are, can be operated by people, human beings, and the shafts that they can be operated by artificial, um, you know, robotics, artificial intelligence, through artificial intelligence machines. Then you are still able to make sure that the company becomes viable. So we're looking at that way. So part of the issue is to say, how do we balance so that we don't lose the current mm -hmm. jobs that are there? So it might not necessarily be easy for us to reskill everyone because it's going to be costly. Uh, it's going to take time. Some of the people, because they are older generation, you might find that they are not even interested in being risky. They are scared of technology. So you have to find a mechanism to be able to say to them, okay, how do we sustain your jobs? And that's why I'm making this example of, um, of, the, of the mining industry as a way of trying to balance between the two. So you have to take a conscious decision to say which are the jobs you're going to save, preserve, which are, are the ones that you will be able to introduce technology and you know, the robotics and the machines, but while balancing, because you've got the responsibility to be able as well, not only save jobs, but make sure that the companies are sustainable, otherwise the investment will leave. That's great, so I, I think with Carl, when we get to robotics, we'll get hopefully even more deeply into that, but that's a great example of where the technology is actually making existing jobs more sustainable for the people who have them, safer, and make the industry last. Um, let me ask one more question about the relative place of South Africa in terms of ec economic development around, you know, compared to other countries around the world. A have you been on the net benefit side of that equation in relation to other countries? Have you capitalized on the opportunity more or do you see your position going backwards in relation to other countries? Not going backwards, but we've not capitalized quite effectively. So there, is, there are efforts from where we're sitting in terms of making sure that we grow, making sure that we develop. Hence, I can state, and one of the key areas is around research and development, especially looking at new technologies, that we are able to increase not only our uh, registration in terms of IP, 
one of the things I think some companies might find it not attractive, but what we have done, for example, to increase our innovative capacity is to be able to say publicly funded research is going to be available for the public so that it's open, we're making it open so that we can increase the level of innovation, we can increase the utilization of technology that we are finding. And we think in those ways we'll be able to compete good, um, in a good way globally. So we're not yet there, I must admit, um, but I think we're getting there. Okay, thank you. That's a great start for the conversation. So let's move to Europe, the European context with Anne Mettler. And Tell us a bit about the dynamics within Europe in terms of addressing inequality within your own societies as you simultaneously are trying to move towards digital transformation of Europe. There's a, there's a lot of tension between those two sides. Absolutely. Um, thank you so much and great to be here this morning. I mean, on the fourth industrial revolution, I, I would say that uh, we warmly embrace it. Europe has a very strong industrial base, so we certainly see a lot of advantages in it. But this issue of the have and the haves nots and the inequality is really important for us. You know that Europe prides itself on having um, some of the most comprehensive welfare states uh, in the world. Uh, social market economy is something that we deeply believe in. So these are issues that really uh, uh, we spend a lot of time thinking about. On the opportunity side, however, I mean, it is clear to us that in the, um, in the digital age, uh, one of the real opportunities is a more inclusive and diverse labor force. I mean, for anyone who, uh, who sort of glorifies the industrial age, I have to say I grew up in Germany in the 1970s and 1980s, and I tell you, it wasn't exactly the kind of place where women would thrive. I mean, so I think that's one thing that's really good about the digital age. It gives more opportunities for women. It gives more opportunities uh, also for young people. I see a lot of employers saying, I want young people. They have these digital skills that we need. This used to be very different. Huh? And uh, let me say on this as well, because oftentimes there's sort of this horror scenario that we're going to lose all our jobs and the robots are going to come for us. At least in Europe, this is not true. We have not seen technological unemployment. In fact, the employment rates have never been as high as they are today. So, uh, you know, so I just want to say that because I think it's really important. There is a lot of anxiety and, and, and it's very important to, to, to state this. That being said, of course, not all is well. Uh, the inequalities are, in, you know, um, are, are developing the way you, you, you just uh, suggested. There is a hollowing out of the middle class. I mean, that is where we are very clear, clearly seeing and this goes back to the issue of skills. We have the same issues. So one of the things that we are uh, trying to advocate is to look less, uh, be a little bit less obsessed with formal education um, and focus more on skills. And uh, that sounds much easier than it actually is uh, because one of the wise things that uh, someone from the OECD, the gentleman who heads the education department once said to me, he said, the problem with Europe is it's overeducated and underskilled, and that actually captures it very well. We have a lot of people with university degrees, but they can't actually do the jobs that are out there. So this issue of skills we're paying a lot of attention to. And again, here, I think this can play to our strengths. You know that uh, countries like Germany have world famous apprenticeship schemes. So this is not necessarily for people who are on a university track, but who really learn a skill, a craft, and if we now mix that with digital skills, I think that that can give us a very good uh, competitive advantage. So it is this, this mixture between opportunity and uh, between uh, some of the downsides that can be addressed through active social policy and, uh, and uh, anticipation of what is to come. So I get a mixed picture that there is, there is a lot of anxiety. Um, it's not so much unemployment, it's underutilization of workers, the need to reskill. What about the issue of distribution of the upside benefits? Yeah. No, and, and let me go back to that. The real, I mean, one of the real issues is that there is sort of a discrepancy between people who have full-time contracts that are essentially, you cannot dismiss, and a growing number of people who are sort of on short-term contracts that need to be renewed. Uh, and this is, this is a real issue, I have to say. 
Um, I think one of the things that uh, happened recently in the European context that was very important is a realization on the side of politicians that we, we need to reaffirm our commitment to social welfare. And this happened last November in Göteborg in Sweden. All EU leaders, heads of government, came together for a social summit where they launched something that they called the European Pillar of Social Rights. And it was a reiteration of social rights that Europeans have, but it expanded it, you know, it, it, it applies no longer just to people who have these full-time contracts, but also to everyone else. So this is people in the gig economy. You now have uh, situations where we're moving into people who have these uh, short-term contracts or who are self-employed, who now will get uh, maternity benefits, they will get paid vacation. And because what we're realizing is that we cannot have a social welfare state that is just for, for, for a shrinking number of people. So if we are true to what we want to be, we need to bring the social welfare system essentially into the 21st century. So that means you keep the flexibility, but you also provide security that people frankly need. You know? so, so I think this is one of the ways that, that we are trying to manage the situation because you of course have to be cognizant that in democracies where people have a vote, it's very important. It's not just very important. It is critical that we bring people along because otherwise we pay, we pay the bill at the next election. So uh, let me ask one last question for you in this round about Europe's position in relation to other countries. Let's just take the United States in terms of um, being a place of innovation for, mm -hmm. for digital technology in mm -hmm. particular. Um, you've taken you know, global leadership positions on things like privacy. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people think it has consequences for the development and innovation of technology inside Europe. Mm -hmm. What do you say to that? I, I know that this is a, a common stereotype. It is, uh, Europe certainly uh, maybe doesn't have the, uh, the gives the perception that it is the most innovative place. However, I will say we are home to 28 unicorns. Uh, we have seen um, a very significant increase in greenfield investment, particularly in ICT. And I believe that doing the right thing in digital pays off in the long term. So it was indeed a very big bet that Europe took making privacy a fundamental rights of Europeans. It may have given us certain uh, disadvantages in the short term, but um, in the long term, I think doing the right thing and developing human-centered technology, technology at the service of humans and not the other way around, will be the way forward. And in any case for Europe, it is the only way forward uh, because that's how we do business. And I believe that there will be markets that will be created around this, and that's where we want to play. That's, that's a positive theme, that the idea that human-centered technology will be your, uh, your advantage, and differentiating factor for Absolutely. Europe. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. OK, great. Um, well, let's welcome uh, Rafat Akali uh, from Yemen. And I know you've had a variety of different roles, but you are currently the chairman of Resonate at the Yemen Foundation. Um, why don't you first tell us a little bit about that work, and then we'll go into the context of, of Yemen and its embrace of digital technology. For sure, thank you. Um, and actually, maybe I'll tell that story of how um, the work that I'm doing right now is relevant to Yemen and, and many other uh, developing countries, because. I started off um, as an activist uh, in Resonate Yemen and used technology a lot in terms of trying to influence public discourse uh, in Yemen, trying to mobilize uh, young people, trying to engage young people in, in, in public policy um, in Yemen. And right now what I'm doing is I'm heading uh, the secretariat of um, a, a research commission called Pathways for Prosperity. And that's operating at the University of Oxford at the Blavatnik School of Government. And what we are trying to do with that commission is, is really look at things from the developing country perspective and see how does these technological advancements um, work in developing countries? How can it be more as um, opportunities rather than uh, threats for developing countries? So our, our starting point when we looked at the global debate on technology was that it's, 
it was very much focused on the rich world, and it's very much um, focused on what is happening with uh, automation and robotics and AI in the rich world. And, and we wanted to try and kind of rebalance that conversation a little bit and have it, first of all, um, focused more on the developing uh, world. Um, and on the other side, try to balance the narrative that is happening right now, and I'm glad to hear the other panelists are on the same <laughs> uh, page on that, uh, because a lot of the narrative was either a doomsday scenario and we're gonna lose all our jobs and robots are gonna take over, um, or a silver bullet scenario, you know, technology is the answer, and, and if only. And, and when we talk to a lot of policymakers all across the developing world, um, they really get confused. There's a, a, more a state of paralysis because they're being hit by these conversations at the background um, that keep telling the same story, focusing on numbers. There's a lot of focus on numbers out there. And the numbers game is, is not the best way to, to drive people to action because it doesn't give people um, the tools that they need to actually uh, take action on it. And so you'll see a lot of numbers running around of how many jobs are at risk of automation, how many jobs will be lost. Um, two days ago, WEF um, had another report saying how, exactly how many million jobs will be created <laughs> and others. And I think this forecasting uh, game, uh, although it's, um, in, in ways easy to shape the narrative around, easy to, to tell a, an, a story, um, but it's, it's very confusing because I'll give you an example for OECD, as you said. Um, there are two reports, we looked at all the reports out there, and there's two reports, for example, that show just the wide variations. One report from OECD that says 9% of jobs are at risk of automation. There's another report, uh, an academic report, that, that marked kind of this whole move towards numbers that said 47% of jobs in OECD. So there's, there's just this wide range of, of estimates, and it all depends on the details of the methodology that is used and all that. So we didn't want to focus on the numbers. We wanted to try and drive the conversation towards what can societies do? What can policymakers, private sector, and citizens do in a very concrete way? And, and that's what we've been doing since January when we launched Pathways for Prosperity. Um, and, and we worked across a number of countries. We did um, uh, a lot of engagement events and, and also a lot of um, research and background uh, work. And I think where we are ending and we'll be launching our report in, in, a, in a couple of weeks, but where, where we are is that countries, this is a, a historic moment basically. Technology is disrupting lives as, as never before. And if developing countries are not able to um, take a clear stand on it, take a clear framework. So far, all the talk about technology in countries, at least like Yemen and others, has been, you know, how to automate some government services, um, how do we, uh, you know, create one-stop shops, for example, for businesses to uh, just do their filing online or, or do something like that. But that's not the nature of the changes that are happening. It's, it's much more wider and, and, and we need a, a much more wholesome, I, I guess, approach uh, to it. Great. Um, well, let me, let me first ask a very, go to the number and very basic question. What is the level of uh, connectivity in Yemen? In Yemen, it's very low. And uh, because Yemen is, of course, one of the not only least developed countries, but fragile and currently in, in conflict. Um, and so the latest numbers were around 14, 15% uh, of connectivity to the internet. But that's actually one of the key things that we looked at is, is this conversation around access. Because when we talk about access, a lot of, um, again, the, uh, the focus has been on how do we get access to people, access in terms of infrastructure, kind of, you know, mobile signals uh, in places. And, and what we looked at is, although we've made across the developing world huge um, advances in, in access, so right now I think the numbers are around 80% are covered uh, one way or another by, by a network. But the real issue is in terms of utilization or usage. Are people actually using uh, the internet? And that's where we see a huge gap. So the conversation we're trying to shift now in terms of, of digital access is moving away from access or focus of, on access to utilization and impact. Um, and, and that's where we're way behind in developing countries. We look at um, places like um, Pakistan, for example, and others where it's not about access, it's no, now more about cultural issues, for example, in terms of 
marginalization of, uh, for example, uh, women in many societies where you have less than 50% of women when compared to men who have a, who have a mobile phone or use the internet. Um, also in terms of um, poverty levels. So of course, a huge issue with, with um, affordability. So even if there is a network and a cell tower somewhere, um, I can't afford it, so I can't use it. Um, and a huge uh, also rural urban divide because a lot of network companies don't have the right incentives, for example, to, to be going to the rural areas uh, unless there's a proper policy framework that is guiding them that way. Got it, okay, great. Um, I'm gonna move on just because we're gonna, we wanna make sure we have plenty of time to have questions with the audience. Um, I'm gonna give Seth a chance to take, get, catch his breath now that he's here and ask Carl a few questions. Carl is the CEO of Soft Rob Robotics. Um, and I, I think let's just go straight on to this, this big narrative out there in the world that the robots are taking the jobs. I mean, so far in this panel, that's not what we've heard. We've heard about um, utilizing robotics to help make jobs sustainable in certain industries um, and playing a big role in reskilling, that kind of thing. So give us the big picture from your point of view on that particular strand. So, so thank you so much. I think there's a couple different ways we have to cut this. Um, one, we have to cut it from a uh, mature economy and one from a developing economy. And then we have to cut it from a physical into a, a data. And that's the great thing about the fourth industrial revolution is we're just not moving physical goods. We're not manufacturing, we're not containerizing, we're not shipping by ocean lanes as we can now move things virtually. And, and I think that's a good thing because now I can move manufacturing globally at the speed of light. And I think that is something we have not utilized. And the way I'll bring that full circle is where we see robotics adoption really taking off today is the mature economies. And the reason for that is the demographics in the mature economies um, there's just not enough people being born to fill the jobs. And so it's not really a skilling problem, it's just having enough people in the, in the area to actually do the work. In the United States, we have a 600,000 um, job deficit right now. There's 6.4 million jobs that are posted and there's 5.8 million people looking for work. And so we can, we can train all day long, but we're not gonna fill those jobs. And this is the same thing that we see in Europe we see it in Australia, we see it developing in China now, as China's seeing much more competition um, in an aging demographic. And so I think there, robotics is really coming in to sustain the means of production of physical goods. Um, is can we keep shipping product? Can we, can we make sure that when I wake up today, if I manage a factory, I'm gonna have the right amount of people in that factory to produce? And so I think there, Robotics in the, the mature economy is, is really a sustaining growth story. It's not taking jobs, it's keeping, keeping production running. That's what I see every day with my customers. Now what I think is interesting though is robotics and the fourth industrial revolution have a unique capability that we don't talk about, which is bringing the work to the worker. So for centuries, the worker had to move to the work. They had to migrate, they had to find ways. And now, um, Hiring robotics engineers in the United States is a very challenging thing. In Massachusetts, there's 0% unemployment for computer scientists, electrical engineers, and mechanical engineers. But there's a lot of people around the world that can write software, and we can work with them around the world. And so we were discussing earlier how there's initiatives right now in Kenya and Nigeria where Western companies, venture-backed companies, have started um, software boot camps. And so they go into a developed economy, they recruit people, they teach them how to write software, and then they link that back into the mature economies where there's a shortage of this skill. And so now virtually, we can have people in Nigeria, people in Kenya, some of the best machine vision engineers in the world are in the Ukraine, now having jobs directly supporting efforts in the mature economies. And so I think there, um, that is a, something we've not talked enough about is how because the fourth industrial revolution, a big part of our product is virtual, is electronic, is we can now um, really move the work to the worker. And how do we do that? I think it's a, it's a skills problem. I, I love to hear it's not an education problem, it's a skills problem. And I don't think it's a utilization problem, is, is can, can policymakers create um, access to technology and the skilling so that we can then um, use the, the fourth industrial revolution to create jobs? globally. So this is, this is, could 
potentially become a very positive strand in the narrative, that it's not really about taking jobs, it's about ha having people be better employed going forward. And I can just use one quick example. Um, you know, right now at our company, we, we have to deploy a lot of robots in remote areas, the California desert. There's no one there to supervise the, those robots. But with standard broadband, I can have someone in Dayton, Ohio, which is a left behind community, they can sit in a call center with benefits and supervise robots anywhere in the world. And so that's the kind of work we're doing today. And so it's just not what could be, it, it, it's what is today. Great, um, and hopefully we can get into a little bit what's gonna be needed in terms of public-private partnerships to further develop this ability to s get people skilled in this new technology. I don't know if you have a quick comment on that. Um, I, if you look at the New Deal and what the New Deal did for telephone installations, how many, you know, hundreds of miles of telephone and telegraph line were run as part of the New Deal and connecting rural parts of the United States as a, and then what impact that had. Um, obviously, private enterprise doesn't want to run um, fiber or connectivity, and private enterprise really doesn't want to do skill creation, but we're seeing a lot of that. We're now seeing German companies bringing apprenticeship programs in globally to get the skills, um, but I think that's where the, the policy could really impact it. Is it's, it's connectivity, it's accessibility, and it's the skills um, that, that could really move this forward and let um, the developing economies take advantage of the fourth industrial revolution. There's a good example, maybe if, if I'd mentioned, there's a good example in Indonesia, just doing that, where the Indonesian government is working with private sector to extend, I think it's around 13,000 kilometers of fiber optic around the, uh, they're calling it the fiber ringway. Um, but that, that's an example of, of policymakers taking action to uh, get their countries digital ready, um, as we call it. Absolutely. So let's move on to Seth uh, Berkeley, who is the Chief Executive Officer of Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance of Geneva. Welcome, thank you for making it here. Um, so why don't you just give us a big picture of, of what are the, what's happened in terms of digital technology or fourth IR technologies improving health and how that has affected inequality globally. First of all, let me apologize for being late, and I suppose we need a fourth industrial revolution technology for traffic in this yes. city, taking an hour and a half to get eight kilometers. So I apologize to everyone. Yep. Um, but, but all joking aside, I, I think we're seeing um, a dramatic transformation. But let me, let me give an example of, of haves and have-nots of how the technology has been used. So if I look at one of the challenges, so you've probably heard we're responsible for helping countries with their vaccinations, and, and vaccines are the most distributed health technology. About 86% of children in the world are, are vaccinated with at least three doses of the tracer vaccine, DPT-3. So that's, that's a good statistic. That still means 14% aren't. But if I try to be really honest and tell you how much I know about that data, um, the truth is, is that a third of children in the world are not registered. They don't have a birth certificate. So we don't know technically that they exist. And this is a real problem for, particularly for people trying to own land, for trying to open bank accounts. You talked about gender disparities. 42% of women in the world don't have access to a bank account. So these are problems. And one of my favorite pictures is a picture of an Indian bureaucrat sitting in a clinic with a big book taking you know, careful notes as they do with piles of records on both sides but he has two cell phones sitting on there, but of course he's not using those. And this is where we can make that transition. And this is something that is, is going on, but we all understand that we should be preponing that because the technology exists to solve that problem today. Now let me give you the opposite extreme. So in Rwanda now, there is a fabulous partnership where um, in Rwanda, blood is being driven, given by drone. So what happens is when somebody, a woman comes into a clinic and she's hemorrhaging from childbirth, and this is unexpected, you don't know where this is gonna happen, you don't know what her blood type is or if there's a car accident, you need blood, um, you text to a central location where there's a blood bank and within 20 minutes as much blood as you need is delivered to that site. 
This has been transformational because we've seen wastage of blood go from quite high levels down to virtually zero. Plus, because it's a central blood bank, they can do, uh, um, you know, break it down and use cell components and have all the different types of blood available. Now, what's interesting about that is the company that, that is doing that, um, uh, Zipline, is a California startup who began in the U.S. and got into a thicket of regulatory problems, including flight paths for general aviation. I'm a pilot. I know you fly low if you're trying to stay out of the airways, which would be a problem. Rwanda didn't have that problem. So here the innovation is being done in Rwanda. They've gone through 3D printing, improving the drones, the reliability of the service, and now that is expanding to other countries, to Ghana, to Nigeria, and on. And, 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 and the last thing I'd say about that is, of course, the question would be, you know, how do you think about the regulatory system for something like drones? And this is where the Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution has been really helpful. They have a, a drone um, a group that is working on regulation, and Rwanda was the first case where they came in and said, let's use this experience, let's put together what this regulatory framework would look like so that other countries can quickly adapt this. Now, you know, these are two examples of, you know, uh, uh, haves and have-nots, but I personally believe that the technology is going to transform the health space. I, I missed some of the earlier comments, but I suspe suspect people talked about the ability, for example, to provide training from a distance, to allow people to have knowledge available, to, you know, get out informatics. And, and, and these things are, are obvious. They depend upon connectivity. Uh, we work in Yemen. You talked about the very um, low connectivity there. But more and more, we, you know, there are more cell phones now than there are toilets in the world. So, I mean, the point is that this is here to stay, and the challenge is going to be how to accelerate its use to improve healthcare outcomes. That's great. So um, you're talking about how these technologies are going to transform the health space, but then by transforming the health space, also transform the societies and the ability of of, to increase economic growth throughout those societies. So it's a mutually reinforcing circle there. Well, let me, I mean, I mean, let me say specifically, so when we talk about vital registration, the most common vital registration document in the world is not a birth certificate, it's not a death certificate, it's not a marriage certificate, it is actually a child health card. Because although I gave you a statistic for three doses, the first dose, probably 95% of kids in the world get the first dose of vaccine. They get some type of paper record with that. If we could convert that into a vital registration, what then happens is that becomes the registration for later on for school enrollment. It becomes a registration for voting. It becomes a registration for taxes. And as you can imagine, when societies today that don't have these registrations go out and say, we want to register you for taxes, they have a hard time finding people. Whereas if you do it at childhood, you then um, build a system up that will allow this to move forward. Um, we're going to go to the, to the audience, and I'm going to ask a question. I will say I have seen that presentation of Zipline. It's pretty amazing. But the thing that made that work was the government n focusing and saying, we want, w we're going to test one thing, blood delivery. Don't do everything. Do one thing. Do it here in this contained geography. And it, it's a great model for potentially um, other, other types of innovation. And that company thinks it's going to be the d drone delivery for everything, everywhere. So, I mean, it's fascinating that it's starting off in Rwanda. Well, it started, actually. The reason we got involved, it actually started the concept was, how about using it for rabies vaccine delivery? Because, as you can imagine, if you get bitten by a rabid dog, it's quite expensive, the treatment for rabies. To have that available in every clinic everywhere, most of it would expire unused or would be used for non-critical cases. So the idea was to have a rapid delivery service for that. Turned out that Rwanda had a pretty good dog control and, and, and vaccination system, so they didn't have a great need. Blood was more important. But now they're adding in rabies, and Ghana is going to do a broader set of, they're going to do not just um, uh, uh, blood and, and rabies vaccine, but also general general vaccines filling in for stock outs. So I think we're going to see now, with some experience, this be transformed into just-in-time delivery for critical issues. Yeah, it's really ex exciting. Okay, so I want to let people
people in the audience raise some questions, but we've been asked to do a slightly different model. You may have done it yesterday, where take a minute at your tables, literally one minute, because we, we don't have that much time. It's not going to be a 10-minute conversation. Collect your thoughts about the priority questions you'd like to ask these panelists. And I'm just going to throw out one sort of big picture question. I mean, there's all kinds of digital divides we've been talking about for a long time. And, and the question is, moving beyond just straight up connectivity and the fact that 50% of the planet is not quite connected, how do you think that the you know, AI, IoT type technologies are going to impact equality globally? Do you think it's going to exacerbate the problem and what can we do to mitigate that? Or do you think that there's actually the, the possibility that those technologies help us leapfrog and let the, uh, mitigate the inequality between countries? So take, take two minutes or one, 60 seconds, 60 seconds, collect your thoughts. They, it's a new model. <laughs> If there are questions, just in case there are questions you would like to ask each other, I, I took the early bus. tell those guys. <laughs> okay. So she's asked us to think of questions we would ask each other okay. if time permits. So, Seth, so what, what do you fly, Seth? Uh, I fly a Cessna 182. Great airplane. <laughs> you Retract? Do you have retra retractable gear on it? Uh, not on this okay. one, but okay. I, 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 that's what you would ask him. That's what I flew. <laughs> airplane people like talking about airplanes. More, so more I, I flew in the Navy, and yeah, I'm, so I don't have time to fly right now, but eventually. Oh, no, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure. Okay. Yeah, but I, I actually flew in the, the, uh, the Navy and Air Force. Yeah, I was in the uniformed service. I turned in a T-34. I was in the Where? Where did you fly? Dobbins Air Force Base. Yeah, those T-34 Bravos are scattered around military bases everywhere. Yeah, yeah I was confused when you said you fly, and I'm like, in the bio, I thought you're the one who's flying. I'm like, probably I mixed up. <laughs> well, I think the so pilot mixed it up. They're benefiting anyone. You know, this way, flight and then I know Zipline. It's an amazing company. Yeah. Ma How do we get them in your company? Well, I mean, this is one of the big companies. Yeah. All the companies are going to start. Very well-being. My dream is to have a You know what's interesting about Zipline, which um, I think is obvious, but not everyone knows, is everyone's focused on quad rotors, and the energy inefficiency of a quad rotor is just, it's stupid, right? You know, I need more power, I need a bigger battery, I need a bigger motor, I need more, like, fixed wing drone that that's autonomous, so that it doesn't, it, dro it, you know, it parachutes, right? It, it airdrops. Um, okay. It's just so, it's the, the easy but the right way. And they've been easy to cover long I'm sorry to say, I think I'm going to try to bring you all back. That's a little crazy. They were said give them two minutes. Okay. Sorry, sorry to interrupt, but I, you know, that this is the new model. We're just experimenting and see if that was adequate to to get any issues on the table. And so let's just see what kind of themes emerge that you'd like to explore or questions that you have. Let's go right here and right there, both of you. Hi, I'm Po Shen Lo. I'm from the Young Scientists group here. Um, I'm a math professor at Carnegie Mellon University, and I'm also the national coach of the U.S. Math Olympiad team. Um, uh, actually, something I wanted to comment is about um, the, the, the original Industrial Revolution was something that unlocked physical power. Basically, it used fossil fuels to uh, amplify the amount of physical impact a person could have. Therefore, to be a have in that economy was to be able to direct physical power. In some sense, we celebrate athletics. We have the Olympics, and, and, and we somehow really celebrate physical things. But if you think about what makes this industrial revolution different, it is that we have invented a device, computers, that are able to do certain things one billion times faster than humans. Those things are calculation, memory, and communication. These are all intellectual, not physical. And so what I'm talking about here is that in some sense, the difference between have and have not now is whether or not you can direct this 
intellectual capacity. In fact, there were some comments about uh, boot camps, software boot camps. Those are, of course, very good. But at the same time, if you want to be one of the value creators, you actually have to have more than the boot camp. Actually, it then comes down to this fundamental mathematics and science. And if you, if you draw back the analogy, we celebrate athletic achievements and we glorify those. However, maybe if we want to have more haves in the economy, we should actually really be doing huge campaigns to celebrate intellectual capacity. And maybe I'll, I'll then add one more comment about a group that's not represented in this panel, which is how China is operating. Actually, they have a huge AI conference going on right now. And there's been an enormous investment in developing the intellectual uh, STEM capacity of their entire population. And actually in China, if you do math uh, or any academic competitions, you're celebrated as much as the athletes. And so what I wanted to comment is maybe we should actually be trying really as a societies to drive into that scientific and uh, that, that uh, uh, the hard science intellectual component in order to play in this, uh, in this fourth industrial revolution. That's great. Let me, oh, did you want to add to that? Um, so added on that, I, I had a question uh, that was for Carl. Yes. Uh, to say, you know, you said about creating jobs in Nigeria first. Yes. So for me, when I hear what Roshan says and what you say, for me, it's just extracting, uh, again, to create value in our economies. So we're leaving behind even more because you're taking that talent, are extracting it to create value in our world. What do we leave behind in terms of value? I think this is the fact that I'm really interested in. Yeah. How can we uh, use this, you know, skills, but to create value in these economies that are already, because otherwise you're making the digital gap not smaller, but way wider. So, so I, I disagree with that, and I'll, and I'll tell you why. Um, is, you know, th who's been to Shenzhen? Who's been to Guangzhou? And they have that great diorama of what it looked like in 1980. What did it look like? It was just, it was a delta. There was green everywhere, and you look now. And so, so I'm, I'm a fundamental believer in free trade creates global value. Um, and I, I don't want to argue that, but, but that's what I believe, and I believe digital free trade will create greater value. And so Shenzhen developed because their value was they could manufacture at lower cost. And so you look at that journey that has, has taken us to is low-cost manufacturing into upskilling, into I don't think Shenzhen would be the center of robotics and AI today if they had not started creating value in manufacturing. And so that's why I see the, the offshore software development, the software development in the emerging world um, I think it's the perfect analogy because if I have thousands of people in Nigeria now who can write code, then one day they're going to wake up with an idea and they're going to start a company. They're going to have the basic skills to create value and, and create that baseline. And so I don't see it purely as extracting value. Um, I think it's a lifelong skill. I think you're reskilling um, an entire workforce and I think you're creating value there just as we have um, to use Shenzhen as an example of now manufacturing excellence a robotics excellence um, in the world, and so I, I don't see it as extracting value. I, I see it really as free trade of ideas and skills that will create value in the long term. I think Seth wanted to, and did yeah. you want to get in, Ann? And I just I agree, but add on to that and some, some disagreements, and that is, I mean, I was talking a few moments ago about Zipline. Why was Rwanda a good place? Well, Paul Kagame has invested in science and technology. And so they have a team. They're trying to become the digital you know, center. They, they want to be the Switzerland of Africa. Um, the really interesting issue, as we said to Zipline, is if you want to show your value, you've got to go somewhere that doesn't have that. And it's the Rwandese that will go and train. But the question is, are other governments investing in this? So if you go back to the Nigeria example, the school systems in the north are terrible terrible. So for the affluent, of course, they can go to private schools, they can get educated, they can do coding. But one of the questions is, will governments invest? And I think if you look at China, they certainly have invested. I know there are schools that are better and there are tutors, but that has been a priority. So one of the challenges is how do we get that wisdom to governments about the priority of investing in their human capital? I mean, it's, it's health, it's education, it's obviously nutrition. Those three will ultimately ultimately drive what the value is to be able to do the things you're talking about in the future. Last quick point is, you know, for me, not every country has to have the coders, has to have all the scientists, but they do need to be good consumers of technology. And so for me, you know, the, the real advantage of this is that we can blow it out without having each place, you know, build the, the, the actual models and work themselves. Absolutely. The one thing I'll, I'll say to Bob, 
is um, completely agree with that. And the, one of the phrases we always say is the best job creator is, a, is an educational system. And, and I think that's exactly what you were saying. Great, Anne? Yeah, I wanted to come in on this issue of intelligence uh, because I think that's really important. Uh, because um, what is intelligence? As machines start to learn, even very intelligent, high-skilled jobs will probably go someday. So I heard the other day a, um, a CEO of a major airline say that in the future, um, airplanes will essentially be flying drones. You won't even need pilots anymore. You know, I would also have some questions around maybe radiologists or, or some stockbrokers. So, so I think we, we need to rethink a little bit what intelligence means. And what we have been uh, starting to discuss is actually the need to look at human skills. Um, because uh, there are skills that machines can never have, such as empathy, creativity, collaboration, and that that is one thing we need to focus on even if it sounds counterintuitive to focus on human skills. And secondly, to also look at ethics and morals. I mean, I honestly have to say, um, uh, two days into this, I am a little concerned about some of this hype about AI and how great it's gonna be. I have to tell you, I think this can go terribly wrong. Because uh, if you only put engineers, uh, and you know AI originally comes out of defense research. Huh? These are people who worked in the military. And if they're going to be teaching machines how to learn, I have some real questions. So in Europe, we are discussing making it obligatory for people who do the AI, the engineers, to take courses in humanities and ethics. This is really important. I can really only say we're moving into a world potentially of autonomous lethal weapons that will be operated by machines. This has the potential to go terribly wrong if we don't think today and anticipate some of the challenges that can come. Mm -hmm. Did you want to jump in? Yeah, I just, maybe let me come in. The issue of, I think she's speaking to the issue of transdisciplinary studies. I mean, engineering today is not gonna be just the old engineering studying, you've got to be able to be, to do humanities, the importance of it, and therefore balancing through. But again, the other issue that came through um, was, uh, I think, an issue of countries being, the, I think you said, the being willing to consume technologies. I think it's not only about willing to consume, but developers as well of technologies. Um, it's important because if we do not do that, that's where we lose and the inequality become too huge. Because if you don't create your young, especially the upcoming, I'm speaking from myself and our country, where 60% of our population is young people. That's a huge population. This is the future of our country. If we do not create a system that speaks to them being able to be creators of technology, then they will be left out not only in their own country, but global um, participation. And that's why it's important to balance the two, consumers, but uh, also uh, be innovators. And it's important as well linking it to the education side. Importance of in emphasizing the STEM subjects in many countries, I think we do. There are various areas that you, and, and various lessons that can be learned. But obviously you've got to be able to understand, and I like how you make the example and comparative between the two countries in Africa, um, Rwanda and, and Nigeria. Because sometimes we think one size fits all, which becomes a bit of a challenge. So adapt, uh, adaptability per country what you are able to do for your country, especially when it comes to machines, you've got to be able to analyze what your country's capability is. And that's one example with China. So each country has to look at, yes, we, we compete in globally, but what would work best for us? If my major population, it's about a youth generation, how do I make sure that the opportunities that exist, I close the gap? So that's what I thought is important that we also look at adaptability. Because what happens in another country in terms of machine um, implementation and, and the solutions will not be similarly adaptable into a country. So that thinking that's applicable, which we have to apply, we have to look at and be able to say this is what will work best but while we're allowing ourselves to be globally competitive. 
if I, if I may add, sure. just that, that process, I think, of each country thinking through uh, what they should do. Uh, it has to be um, a dialogue process within society. I think that's where governments need to come with private sector, with citizens, with academia, and think through together what is the position of our country in this and, and make it a priority. And I think that kind of dialogue is, is what's going to move uh, countries ahead because without it, yeah, and, and we're, unfortunately we're not seeing as, as many of those uh, types of dialogues in countries. And I think as soon as a country realizes that this is what we need to do and, and this is the future, it has to start that dialogue process because there are going to be trade-offs and, and it's inevitable. And, and, and unless a society reaches to it together, um, they're never going to reach it. Yeah. You know, it's, it's interesting. I mean, another example that is fascinating is M-Pesa in Kenya, yes. where, um, for all that don't know, that is an internet banking service. It started and people said, this is ridiculous. It's never going to go anywhere. Today, I think 45% of the GDP of Kenya moves through this, you know, micro banking system. And it has really changed the, 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 the dynamics. The, the point would be that other countries now are adapting it and changing it and making it theirs. Um, but you know, before you have an example like that, it's hard for others to move forward. So I think one of the things you need is you need early adapters like that. You need to make sure that people see the value of it and then adapting it and taking it forward. And I suspect that, you know, five or 10 years from now, that will become the norm across the African continent. It'll be much more important than the traditional banking system because it, it, it allows you to leapfrog over branches and you know, legal documents and all the other things that are, are necessary for banking. Great, okay, other questions? Right here and right there. Thank you, my name is Carsten Otto, Germany, Kaisen Institute. I have a question special to Ms. Mettler. <laughs> yeah, you represent the European Union, I see. Uh, in Ge uh, the companies in um, Germany use the force industrial re revolution a lot of time, but the reality is uh, biggest trusts and groups has a different understanding. Mercedes and other understanding in the uh, companies like BMW, Siemens and other than Bosch. Yeah? Uh, it's an um, example, uh, the machine language, machines communicate each other, yeah? Absolutely different in that companies. So, it means the students, we are come from the universities, have maximum an overview about it, yeah? They must start by zero, yeah? So, it means, in, is, it, is something scheduled from European Union side to connect the universities more to the practice from the fourth industrial revolution. Because I see our students must start, start by zero, they know nothing. <laughs> yeah. Great, and then let's take one more and then we'll go to Anne. Um, right up here, if, up here. Hi, Julia Zanzi, I'm a global shaper. I'm from Europe and actually my question is, is very linked to what has just been asked. So we see AI is actually cutting a little bit of the middle skills uh, and more focusing on very high skills and low skills. So we are missing the middle one. And, we, and I'm uh, actually concerned about our generation, millennials and generations that, that are studying now. And when we go and speak to students uh, and in university, they're still the, the, the programs are still the one that we had 10 years ago in some sense. So we hear a lot about the new skills, but how, are, how do we make sure that we are actually intercepting millennials and uh, students' generation that's studying now, uh, especially on these human skills uh, that are not part of the current programs? Great. Anne, do you want to take that one? Sure. Um, on, on the first one, uh, we, we are well aware, I mean, this really is an issue that he addresses, is uh, the lack of knowledge and technology transfer from universities into companies. This is by now a very well recognized uh, problem, which we are tackling. Uh, we have a whole program called uh, the uh, Entrepreneurial University. I also spoke before about our uh, skills strategy, which is very much focused uh, on this. And also in the next seven year funding program for uh, research and science, called, it's called Horizon. This will all be tackled. Uh, we, we know what the shortcomings are uh, in Europe and uh, in the new funding cycle, 
it will be addressed. Uh, because right now, if you look at, um, Europe has the largest public funding program in the world, uh, its Horizon program. Only about 1% one percent of it is spent on knowledge transfer from university into companies. 1%, it's nothing. So, I mean, we are increasing that, we are focusing on it. So please give us some time, uh, the problem has been recognized. On the second uh, one, I mean, from the public policy perspective, it is very difficult to prepare people for jobs that have not yet been created and for skills that we don't yet know we will need. I will tell you very honestly. And that's why I always say the best skill to have is learning how to learn. And it's the adaptability that you speak about. It is impossible for a policymaker to say today, these are gonna be the jobs in 10 or 15 years. And I think we should be very transparent about that. However, I'm an optimist. I said before, all the hype about job losses, we've never seen employment rates so high. So, you know, let's stay positive, let's develop the human-centered technology, let's be aware of what the challenges are, and I think the future is ours for the making, really. Could, could I make one comment there? Um, and you alluded to it, and I think everyone's kind of speaking around it, but I'll just put it out there, is you can't think about the human-centered part enough, because one of the things that's very early studies about artificial intelligence is artificial intelligence, you, you have to teach the machine. And what we find is the bias of the machine, it, it adopts the bias of the person teaching it. And so as we think about multicultural experience, crossing borders, is a, an artificial intelligence program by someone in, in one country will not be adequate for the culture of another. And so having those human skills, imbuing those human skills and bringing in the arts, the sciences, and the human-centered approach um, is one of the things that concerns me a lot. If not, um, we, we will create um, machines that will leave people behind. It's, it's, a, it's a very real concern. Uh, uh, last comment, and then I'm gonna ask everybody to do a little close up. I have a question too. I mean, just interesting, we talked about public-private partnerships before, but academic corporate partnerships. It's interesting, although knowledge can move in every direction, we talked about that, what we're seeing is clustering of you know, startup businesses over the last 15 or 20 years around great academic centers. And even though you theoretically have this ability to move that through space and time, these informal engagements and faculty members moving back and forth and retraining and new ideas coming out is, is really some of the energy that is, that is moving this forward to keep kind of innovation happening. So um, unfortunately, we're almost out of time. I wanna ask each of you to come back to this question of, what does it mean to be human-centered? And the, f the very first question we got about the commitment to intellectual uh, de capacities and, and developing those through society and skill building, all that, how, how do we deal with the challenge of the, of the fact that the AI is going to outstrip human capacities? How do we hold on to a human-centered approach as that happens? Not only, I'm not only concerned about you know, applications for weapons or you know, destructive purposes, I'm just thinking about it and keeping the human as the focal point and as the center of our assessment of the technology. How do you all think about that? Maybe if, if, if I may start. Um, I mean, first of all, the, we need to recognize that at least for developing countries, we're not only dealing with the fourth industrial revolution, we're still dealing with the first and the second and third. So these haven't made it uh, yet into many countries. And so it's, it's a, a c compounded uh, effort. But I think that's where this, this idea of dialogue that I was talking about uh, earlier, this cannot be seen from the angle of one stakeholder, whether it's government, whether it's the scientists or the uh, inventors or tech entrepreneurs or whoever is, is working on it, unless this is a collective um, effort within each society and then across uh, the world uh, with societies coming together. That is not gonna, I think, um, resolve this issue of, of um, uh, human-centered uh, design and human-centered technology. So I think the key is to have this dialogue and the key is for, for countries and societies to work through, as I mentioned, getting digital ready, whether it's the uh, hard infrastructure, you know, the, the fibers and, uh, and cell phones and all that, whether it's the soft infrastructure, which is much more important, uh, the skills, the education, the preparation of 
digital ID systems, uh, you know, microservices, India is doing the India stack things. These are all the things that countries need to start now. It's a closing window of opportunity and there's a real urgency for them to, to start doing it. And then making sure that we have the framework for supporting innovation regulations that allow people to test, that don't constrict uh, early on uh, innovators from doing something. And then most importantly, I think, uh, making sure inclusion is always the number one uh, thing because we don't want to repeat the experiences of industrial revolution and others um, where there's, there was huge uh, costs paid by regular people. And so now we're, we're ahead of the game a little bit and we're discussing this already, so we need to get ready for it. Great, and we're, since we're out of time super fast, we're just gonna go down the line. Or actually, we'll start right okay. here. No, just, just for me quickly, I think the issue of human-centered approach, it's, it's for the interdisciplinary studies. Mm -hmm. If we can start there, when you make sure that in terms of your curriculum and all that, you do not en end up with your engineering studies just being mainline, but bring in the humanities, as you are saying. But not only that, I mean, we, as I talked about the issue of, in, uh, of even adaptability, when you look at the issues of fourth industrial revolution, especially on the artificial intelligence, there's quite a number of things that we've got to consider beyond human-centered. I mean, for example, if you look at the face recognition, when you look at an African face, you can, it can recognize. So for us, it's adaptability again, because if I put my face or I put my name or I put something, it's not recognizable. So those are some of the things that we've got to be able to deal with for us beyond just the human-centered, but more cultural focused, more adaptive for us as Africans, for example. Yeah, that's right. It's quite important for us um, to be able to say this will deal with who we are as Africans and so that I don't feel a part of me being taken away in terms of my dignity and who I am as my identity. Great, Anne? I think when AI is used to make important decisions, there needs to be a human um, to take the final decision because we know now that machines actually make decisions over who is hired, who is not hired. They take uh, decisions on medical uh, opinions. They take decisions in many areas. And I think, uh, at least for me, I would have a very hard time saying this algorithm you know, decided this. Um, I, I think there needs to be a human along the sort of chain of command and ideally in the final stage. I think that will be very important. So in other words, inclusion of humans, not just inclusion of people within society. Exactly. Yeah. I, you know, I think it's, it's technology empathy. I mean, it has to be a big part of it as we, we think about using machines to make, make decisions or displace jobs is, is having that empathy there. And then the, the other thing is I'll just reiterate what Anne said is, is it's a skills challenge. It's a lifelong skills challenge. Yeah. And it's just not a traditional education system anymore as we have to use public policy to drive that, that lifelong learning and access to learning. Last but not least. And for me, it's the have, have not questions where we started. Today, we have less people living in absolute poverty than any time in history. That's the great news. But the disparities are getting wider. And one of the questions is, will these new technologies exactly. be focused on the needs of people at the lower end of the scale to help lift them up? Or will all of the benefits of this end up being in the wealthy? We, we risk repeating history in the previous revolutions. Great. Thanks for bringing us back to that. Well, thank you all for coming. Let's give a hand to our panel.